the Bryan Museum and to Melissa for inviting me to uh, speak today. I, when she first asked me, I quickly said that I'm not a Juneteenth expert. Um, but she went on to tell me why um, you all wanted me to speak today. And, I, and, I, and I, I feel like I have a connection to not only Galveston, I have a connection to Texas, um, I have a connection to Juneteenth that I didn't think I would have, I didn't think I had about you know, a decade ago. So thank you so much for having me and, um, and taking time out of your day to come and hear me speak. Uh, I have to say that one of the best things that have, has happened to me recently is that, which I didn't know that was gonna happen, is that I was on a billboard. <laughs> so part of when Meg contacted me and she says, well, we're gonna put you on a billboard, I'm like, a, a, a bill, like a, a billboard? And, and I thought it would be one of those little ones that you see on the side. No, 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 it's a huge billboard yeah. off of 610. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm honored, and, and, and I will have to say in the last month, whenever I was having a hard day, I would just drive by that billboard and wave to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me feel better. Um, it's great to be back in Galveston. Uh, I don't know if you know how much I love this island. I didn't grow up here, but I have spent a lot of time coming back and forth. Uh, I've written a lot of stories about Galveston, a lot of stories about the stores. Um, I covered fashion for 15 years, and so I spent a lot of time you know, chronicling things that, are hap that have happened in Galveston. So it's nice to be back here, and I wish I lived here sometimes too. So um, I spent the morning uh, this morning and it was supposed to be, oh, okay, there's the billboard. Okay. <laughs> uh, my daughter took that picture, and she, she's a pretty good photographer. Um, I spent the morning with, uh, talking about Ava and the Prince. Now, this wasn't the group that, was, that, that spoke, that, that came today. In fact, Galveston ISD um, did not, uh, they, they canceled it last minute, um, I think due to weather. But I have spent, um, a lot of time in the last, I, I wrote a book in, in 2018 and went to over 100 schools. And I, I brought up this photo because this is, this to me speaks to our multicultural world. Um, this photo was taken at an elementary school in um, Spring, and um, I'm sorry, in Pearland. And I just love all of the faces and all of the variety and all of the different hues and this is the world that, that we, are, we, are, we are in. And I think when you see a group of children like that, you see the hope and the possibility of unity. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to talk and click at the same time. Um, I wanna start off by talking about um, my tattoo. So just kind of stay with me on this one. So, um, when I was in college, I decided I wanted to get a tattoo. And this was before everybody was getting a tattoo. It was before people were putting them on their foreheads and their necks and everywhere else. Um, and I decided I wanted something that had a lot of meaning. And when I was uh, early in my journalism career, I attended a lecture by uh, a professor at Spelman College, Spelman in Atlanta, which is a historically black college for women. And she talked about the African diaspora. Now, I had never heard that term before. And what she, what she described was the um, dispers dispersion of African people, people of African descent, through the Americas by way of the transatlantic slave trade. And so there are black people all throughout the Americas because of slavery. And I, I, I was intrigued because I had never heard this before. I had never learned about this before. Um, and she had passed out a folder, and on the folder, so I saw this beautiful heart. And I thought, wow, that's, a, that's the most beautiful heart I've ever seen. Well, it's not a heart. Um, and it's called a Sankofa. And she explained to me, to, to the group, that a Sankofa is, is a Ghanaian um, symbol that, may, that translates to go back and get. And what, it, and, and, in a way, and what it means is for us to know our future, we have to know our past. And I thought that's, that was just so beautiful and in order to know, and in order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. And I think it's so important, uh, a, a, a message, especially now. Um, and so, so 
I, it took me two more decades before I got the nerve up to get a tattoo. And I had two margaritas, and I went and I said, let's do it. <laughs> and it's about that big, okay? <laughs> okay? And you would swear that I, I had tattooed my whole body. Um, so uh, the, the Sankofa stayed with me. And, it's, and I think the reason why I'm here today and the reason why we're talking about Juneteenth is because of that notion of the Sankofa, of, going, of, of reclaiming our history, of understanding the past so that we can go forward into a beautiful future. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll say full disclosure, I am not a historian. I'm not an academic researcher. I'm just a journalist who wanted to know more about Juneteenth. I wanted to learn about more about the significance of the holiday. And I really wanted to dive into stories that we had never told before. Um, one thing about me, I am a proud native Texan. I grew up in Houston, born and raised. I'm a pro product of public and private schools, but neither public or private schools talked about Juneteenth in any way. And I, you know, I paid, and I paid attention in, in Texas history class. And in my Texas history class, not only was not much mention of Juneteenth, there wasn't mention of Latinos or black people or um, um, Native Americans. And, and because I didn't learn much about Juneteenth growing up, I had a very ambivalent feeling about Juneteenth. And when I, you know, and I received, I just wrote a column about this, and, and I think it might have been in high school or college, I got a little card at, at some, some workshop, and it talked about Juneteenth. That's the only thing I ever had. And it was a card, and it talked about how um, the announcement was made in Galveston, to, to the enslaved people in, in Texas, more than 250 of them, uh, to announce that they were free two and a half, two plus years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And at the time, you know, they were having Juneteenth celebrations in Miller Theater and different places, and I just thought, why are we celebrating that? I, I just, I didn't get it. I didn't understand why are we celebrating the fact that it took two and a half years that we were the last ones to know and then understanding that there was no social media, so it took probably another year to get to the other side of Texas. So I just, I, 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 it was, I, I struggled with any accepting Juneteenth as my holiday. Um, let's see. And during the pandemic, you know, it's funny, during the pandemic, I think everybody got introspective, right? Uh, so during the pandemic, one of our photographers, Elizabeth Connolly, approached me about doing a Juneteenth project. And I was like, okay, all right, I mean, Juneteenth, okay, fine. And, but, and I'm glad she did, because I don't know if I would, I would be here. But what, what she did was, we, we, we started coming down to Galveston, and we made frequent trips down to Galveston, visiting the sites where, you know, the Reedy Chapel and all the sites that are here, and stopping along the Emancipation Trail from Galveston to Houston. And if you don't know what the Emancipation Trail is, it's the 51-mile trail that ensla former enslaved black people, when they were free, pop more than likely walked to find a better life. So they, and along the Emancipation Trail, there are these freedmen settlements. And in, in Houston, we have Freedman's Town and Fourth Ward, which was, um, these were products of people who were formerly enslaved. And I remember going to, we went to, we went to places like, hold on, uh-oh, Reedy Chapel. Um, and these are Elizabeth's photos. We went to Reedy Chapel and, um, and spoke with people who had a very connect, very rooted and connected to um, its history. Um, we went, we, I don't know if you can see these, we, we visited um, black cemeteries. And if you've ever had a chance, you know, you've seen cemeteries, and most of them, if you've seen like the big ones, are very well manicured. But you go to some of these black cemeteries and gravestones are missing. Um, um, there's no, there are no gravestones. And one in particular, and this is another story that I did um, in Houston College Park Cemetery, dogs were, people were using it as a dog park which to me is ultimately disrespectful. Um, and, it, and, and, and I remember we were at a, a, 
a, a cemetery off of Harrisburg, and it's right close to a highway. The highway, they put a highway right through the, the cemetery. And it is um, in horrible condition. Um, a lot of times, pe there are not people who have, have the time or the money to maintain them. And I, I remember standing on the land, knowing that I was standing on, some, on top of somebody who was buried here. And there was no, there was no gravestone. And I, was very, I got very emotional that day. And I realized there was so much about this history of Juneteenth that doesn't, that we're not, that's not told to students that I didn't know that makes it so much more a richer experience for everybody to, in, to, to enjoy the celebration. And I, I, I met with um, Sam Collins, who is um, here on this island, who is a, the, the expert historian about Juneteenth. And he introduced me to Opal Lee, who I didn't get a chance, haven't got a chance to interview yet, but she is the uh, grandmother of Juneteenth. Uh, who is based, she's a retired teacher who started walking just to bring awareness about making Juneteenth a, a federal holiday. And to see her tenacity and her dedication and her passion, and she spent years trying to do this. And eventually it was, it was a national holiday in 2021. Um, so, and you see all the, the sweat and work that people are putting into telling this story. And it made me just really, one, appreciate that I had this opportunity during the pandemic to explore this with my colleague, but also recognize that I, we need to talk more about this. We need to share more about these stories. Okay. Uh. okay. I spent time with descendants of um, some of the noted uh, formerly enslaved people, and one happened to be my neighbor, and I didn't know that until I told her I was working on a story. She says, oh, I'm related to um, a Mr. Vance, who, owned, who was one of the um, people in Freedman's Town in Houston who helped find, found that area. That's Rhonda uh, McDonald on the end. And on, on the right is um, uh, Ms. Bostick, who is the great-granddaughter of Jack Yates. And Jack Yates is the one who founded Emancipation Park, which had the first um, uh, Juneteenth celebration in Houston. And to hear their stories and to hear their connection to the land and to Texas and to their family was so powerful. Um, and it gave me incredible perspective about Juneteenth, um, that it was more than a parade and it's more than um, a festival. It honors our resilience and our strength and this ideal of freedom for all. Um, so I became a culture columnist in 2020, shortly after the murder of George Floyd. And I had spent more than a decade, as I mentioned earlier, covering fashion. Um, and I traveled all over the country. And I had a lot of fun doing it. And I interviewed some of from everyone from Oscar de la Renta to Beyonce. And when the pandemic hit, I had become a foster to adoptive mom. And it was something that I had been wanting to do for a long time. It took me two, 10 years to actually get a placement because of my own, going through my own head about being a single mom and such. But I was placed with two children in, in, in 30 days um, in, during the pandemic. And, and at the same time, my father was dying from, of uh, prostate cancer. And at the same time, the world had erupted with the racial turmoil and everything after the police killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and, and, and the list goes on. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have that feeling of wanting to cover fashion like that anymore. I, I had, I felt like I had so many more stories to tell. I had, felt like I had so many things I wanted to share. I was dealing with a foster care system that I, I realized was very, very, problematic and I can see why the, what the issues were. I, I was facing them myself and I had resources. And I just, I, I, I knew I had to do something different. So, you know, as I was contemplating my career, I reached out to my editor at the time and I just said, look, I need to do something different. And I didn't know what that was. And I said, well, how about, can I be a columnist? 
well, you know, you just don't turn up to be a columnist. <laughs> and we started talking about it. And it was just something that, and it happened over a period of uh, probably six months, that we just started talking about it. Then I started formulating in my head. And my first column ran on the day my dad died. And it was kind of bittersweet. I felt like he was there, you know, when I got the papers. Um, and I still get the papers, too. I don't know if you all get the papers. I still get the papers. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I started writing about the issues, issues pertaining to women, women's reproductive rights, issues pertaining voting rights, issues pertaining to, to, to my children and the foster care system. A lot of issues and a lot of um, inequities and things with our children and our education. And it seemed like a natural fit for me. Um, let's see. Let's see. And um, then in uh, December, okay, uh, this is, okay. So this is, this was my, um, my adoption ceremony. My, my adoption of my children was final in um, April of 2023. And I was joined by friends, family, in, in person, some of them are here, and people who are online. And what you don't see in this, in this particular photo, there's a woman right here on this photo, in this photo right here who has her arms wide open. A year, year before, her, do, her son drowned, her baby son drowned three years. Three, he, she was three years old, same age as my son at the time. And the fact that she showed up for me and was there, and it was just such a beautiful occasion, and I was able to write about it. And that was the power of being in this role now, is that I'm able to tell the stories that um, impact my life and impact other people's lives. Um, in December, as Melissa mentioned, um, where'd she go? Oh, there she is. <laughs> um, I became the first black news columnist at the Houston Chronicle. Now, I had no idea that that was, I, I, I just wanted to be a columnist. I didn't know I was the first black person and they were told me and they're like, yeah, what? And I, and I, and I, and I, and I said, well, what about, well, what about, well, what about, and they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Now, it's funny because I, I thought, wow, that, that's interesting. And I, I, I don't know how I, if it was something that I process as something as being a feather in my cap, because I don't see it as that. I see it as, um, you know, that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and what was interesting is that I saw on social media people slamming me because it took the Chronicle so long. Well, I mean, we have also this in the last year, we have our first female publisher, Nancy Meyer. We also have our first female uh, Latina managing editor, which is Alejandra Matos. Um, so even in this day, we continue to make a lot of firsts and recognize that there's a lot of work to do. And what, the, what I see it as is the opportunity to continue to tell the stories. I don't care, you know, it doesn't really matter to me that I was the first black person. I just wanna to continue to do good work and continue to tell stories that, that impact my community and impact our lives. Okay, let's see. So this journey of June, learning about Juneteenth and American history in a deeper way, which Juneteenth is, made me reflect on my own mark in the world. And she mentioned about Year of Joy. So I started Year of Joy about a decade ago as a way, selfishly, as a way to make myself feel better. I mean, I just, you know, sometimes you get into ruts where you are doing the same thing over and over again and you just need to find your joy back. Um, and it, it quickly became this passion of mine to make sure that other children had joyful experiences. Too many children are suffering from poverty, they're suffering from hunger, they're suffering from all these other issues and don't have an opportunity to just be a kid to just have fun, to just go to a holiday ice skating party and see Santa Claus and skate with their friends. 
Um, the beauty of this is that we, you know, each year it has grown. Last year we had 275 kids, I believe. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that we had about 30 of them who were in foster care. Um, I would like to expand that a little more. And, 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 and as I, you know, this has just kind of, it, it has been a very organic thing. I didn't set out to start a nonprofit. I don't make any money off of this. I just, I just wanted to do something that I felt, felt, felt right for me. And like, I, you know, I was a skater and I never could figure out how to bring skating to more kids. And this is the way I've been able to do it. And I've had some amazing volunteers who have showed up and um, including there are people in the audience who have showed up on this. So um, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and I have to say that the, the, over the years, over the, this will be our ninth year in December, we've had 1,500 kids um, participate in this program. I've done other smaller events, um, literacy events, uh, empowerment things, but this is the, the, the one that I can, I feel so, um, uh, you know, just proud of. And one of the things is that I've been able to um, show black skaters, brown skaters, who are very good, and, and bring them to kids who have never seen this before. And as you can see, the, 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 the expression on her face. Um, mm -hmm. I've also been able to um, sponsor two or three um, young girls in free, with free skating lessons and gear. And last year, we had one student who um, is from Colombia, and he learned how to ice skate by watching YouTube videos. He grew up in poverty, came to this country with his family for a better life, um, would ride the bus th several hours to the Galleria just to be able to skate, would sell candy just to get admission into skating. He's now a, going to be a sophomore at Northeastern University in Boston and is working on triple jumps. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, so when we talk about history and legacy in Juneteenth, I think about my own family. My father's people are from um, Bremont, Texas, which is near Waco. Um, it's a tiny town. It was uh, in cotton country, home of the KKK. Um, and out of abject poverty emerged my great uncle, Henry Warren Sewing, founder of the first black bank in the Midwest a Texan. Um, Uncle Henry was the gold standard in our family. His memoir, uh, let me hold this. We have several copies, they're still kind of ready. Um, his memoir, which he wrote in 1970, was required reading in our, in our household. When things got hard, my father would remind me how Uncle Henry pressed through adversity, overcoming poverty, graduating from college, serving in the US military, and founding a bank during the nation's repressive Jim Crow years. All right. All right, so, which brings me to his mural. In 2020, a close friend in Houston, and this is how the world works, because it just, it's, it's so crazy, I can't make this up, connected me with a mural that hung in my great uncle's bank in Kansas City, Kansas. Now, my friend, who has young kids our, um, our same age, we would have our kids play together. And she's from New Orleans. I, ne I didn't know much about her background. And we happened to be talking one day, and she says that her father, um, and they're black, her father owns banks, black-owned banks throughout the country. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, my great uncle founded a bank in Kansas City. And she says, wow, that's interesting. She calls her dad and end up finding out that her dad bought my great uncle's bank <laughs> in, 20, in 20, uh, 2008. And by this, he, had, he passed in, in 1980. The bank changed multiple hands after that and it was no longer family owned, but it was still his foundation. And so I was talking to my friend's father um, and he, he owns Liberty Bank and Trust in, in New Orleans and they're all over the country. And he said, yeah, they had a 12 foot mural that was in the original office 
of H.W. Sewing that they didn't know what to do with. Now, he didn't, you know, Mr. McDonald didn't know much about H.W. Sewing's life, but when I, he sent me a, this picture, I'm like, oh my God. Like, this is his life from the, corn field, the uh, cotton fields in Texas to um, marrying his uh, love of his life right there in the white. You see her right there. That's a, a marriage period. To, to um, um, I mean, all these, all these symbols in here are his journey, his life's journey. And I was, I was blown away. I'd never seen this before. Uh, and I, I used to live in Kansas City, and I never, I never saw this mural before. Um, the mural spans 12 feet. And um, it, all, it shows that he went to, uh, he graduated from Houston Tillerson um, College, which is in um, Austin. And he moved his family to Kansas for a better life with $5 in his pocket. And his mission was to escape the racial violent, violence that was in Texas um, and for a better life. So one thing about when I saw this mural, I went back to read his, 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 um, his autobiography and un really understood that he, he founded the bank in 1947 to provide opportunities, economic, opportunities for economic freedom for black people. His company invested more than $17 million in home mortgage loans for black families who were ineffectively barred from mortgage access at white banks due to redlining pro uh, practices. And so, I've spent the last two years trying to find a home for this mural. Um, and it hasn't been easy. I, may, I, I, I think I wore my friends down. They're like, will, will you will, just find some place for the mural? I, I, would, I called every museum I could possibly find, uh, anybody who would talk to me. I reached out to the, to the um, Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., because they have several items of, uh, of Uncle Henry's in their collection and no one called me back. They wouldn't return my phone call. And I thought even about bringing the painting to Houston because he helped found the other bank, black banks in, in um, the country, including Riverside National Bank, which is now Unity National Bank, which is in uh, Third Ward area. Um, but it was just too costly for me to do that by myself. And still, I would have to find a place for it. So in March, I'm happy to say, this past March, I finally found a home for the mural. And the HW mural is part of the permanent collection at the Black Archives of Mid-America in Kansas City. Right. In March, we had more than 100 family members, friends, political officials, community leaders, business owners, and several former bank employees who are now in their 90s gather for a special dedication ceremony for the mural at the museum to share insp inspirational stories about Uncle Henry's life. And it was, it was pretty spectacular. Um, and how it all came together was just, it, it, I believe it has to be divine intervention because I just, I didn't know how that was gonna happen. The best part is that my children were there um, and they handed out programs, they ate the desserts, and they basked in the celebration of our family's legacy. And of all the things I've done, it is the most satisfying to know that this painting is around for, around for posterity, and it, and it didn't end up in someone's garage sale. Right. Yeah. Understanding the history and legacy of Juneteenth only magnifies the importance of knowing the history and legacy of black Americans, and our stories are American history. And I'd like to leave you with a quote. Uh, and so this is, this is a sewing family right here. We got together and took a picture right there. It's, we're a small family, but a small but mighty family. Um, I want to read a quote from Uncle Henry's uh, memoir. And it's right here. Somewhere along the road of a man's life, there should come a time when he can say to himself, assuredly, this is my shining hour. Yet I hear no bands playing, no whistles blowing, no crowds cheering, no 21 gun salutes that let me know that this is my hour. All I feel is a deep, quiet contentment 
like soft bells tingling with my, within my heart, rejoicing that all of the racial turmoils that, that first fired my soul and the struggles to leave behind the horse and wagon days in the cotton fields of Texas to reach my present envi environment have not been in vain. I have um, I have a few of these cards. I didn't. I don't have a whole uh, a lot, but these are the. I had cards made, um, and then there are a few of them in the back. If you can want to grab one, and there's that's the quote up here, and there's a QR code to the program for the, that we did for the um, mural dedication, and has a, all kinds of history about. Um, this. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yes. And I, let me see, I, during the pandemic, I bought three copies of his book on Amazon. Like I found, they, and, it, and this one is, like this one is signed. It has a signature in here. You know? It's crazy. Hello. Okay. Sorry, it's on. Okay, yeah, uh, we're open for questions. questions, go ahead. So Joy, what did you find the most surprising? Like when you went back and started thinking about your family history, what did you learn? Like your family from the 1860s and maybe where they were on that day or well, in that time frame? You know, um, let's see, I don't know, what did I so far? You know, I think, I don't know, I, I didn't go back that far, um, but what I, in reading this book, you know, when you read this as a teenager and you read it as an adult now, you know, many decades later, you have a different appreciation. And when I, when he, Uncle Henry went, he decided, he had this vision of having, a, wanting a bank and opportunity, uh, economic opportunities for um, black people. And he decided to, to travel to eight cities where they had banks to get best practices. And he traveled during the height of Jim Crow, all of that. And how he did that, I do not know. And I just, I was just, that, that stuck with me. And I, I, I was blown away that even through all of that, he never lost focus of the vision, never lost focus of his mission. And then he, he was a very spiritual man and also talks about that connection to community. And I think that's so important as we move forward with history, it's a connection to community as well. So, yeah. Joy, so good to see good you. To see we you had uh, the privilege of working with each other yes. at the Houston Chronicle. Absolutely. I was on the news side, you were on the feature side. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, what's next? What's on your bucket list? Well, I've been on a, a, a billboard, so I don't have, I don't have much else. <laughs> 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 right now, I'm just trying to get on vacation. We, I have not been on vacation in a year, and we are headed out of here on Sunday, and I just need to get packed and get us on the plane. That's all I'm focused on right now. Um, I don't know, you know, I think as I, I'm, I'm looking for stories that, um, well, hold on. I, I, I think I'm trying to find my way in this new role as a news columnist. I've spent most of my, my career as in features, and it's a little bit different, and I, some, a lot of people don't know what the difference is. So features is more human interest stories. They're more, um, I don't know, featurey. They're more, um, it's not, it really is not about the news. And so as a news columnist, I have to have some type of news element into what I'm writing about. So if I'm writing about women's reproductive rights, it's related to something about legislation. If I'm writing about foster care, it's related to something, you know what I mean? If I'm, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot different. And I'm trying to find my footing in this new role and figure out what stories I'm passionate about so that I can continue to write that. And um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. So if anybody has any, any story ideas, please, I'm always, I'm always open to them. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll come to you. Excuse me. Hi, Joy. Um, as an educator, I'd like your uh, input on what do you think we as adults and so forth can do? Because you even mentioned that we don't know our history. And 
just as you said, we need to know the stories, mm -hmm. the marginalized stories, the African-American stories, the Latino stories, mm -hmm. and so forth. How do we do that? Because I am an educator is not in our curriculum. You know what, I mean, that, I think that's the biggest struggle right now, right? I mean, uh, you know, we have books being banned and curriculums being rewritten and, um, you know, um, all, you know, all the fights for all of our rights being taken out of the history books. I, I, I think as we continue to have forums like this and then expand it to children and expand it to um, um, elementary school level, because I think that's really where you need to start this. Um, I continue to have conversations with your own children. Uh, I wish I had an answer. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I know that I have talked to my children about slavery. I've talked to my children about, and it's not to be scared. It's not to be shamed. It's not, it's not that. It's just, this is our history. This is where we, and look at where we are now. Look at this. Look, look, look at this, this audience right here. You know what I mean? And I think, what, I feel like a lot of what we're missing in this conversation about when they start talking about censoring history is that it's not a celebration of where we are now because we have come so far. I mean, we have a, yes, we have a lot, there are a lot of things that need to happen, but I, I, I was even telling my daughter, I said, you know, sweetheart, when Uncle Henry was a lot alive and, and, and founding the bank, I don't know if we could live in this house, what we're doing. I don't know if we could go ice skating. I don't know if we could do all. So I think it's just understanding that it, history is a journey and hopefully we evolve as people and get better and better and I think um, that's an important lesson to teach. Yeah. I'm coming to you. Do you want to have a question? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Sure. Do you want to? Um, I think maybe other people in the room might remember this. I'm from New Orleans too. Okay. And I remember going to Catholic school and we had our first two black children who came to school. Mm -hmm. And for us little kids, it was no big deal. It was like, great. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to drink out of the same water fountains. Fine. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the same bathrooms. Fine. Mm -hmm. So as little kids, it was not a big deal for yeah. us. It was more um, integrating right. the, the familiar kinds of things. And so, Joy, maybe if you could just comment maybe on what you learned, if you can, about the whole segregation and like that change, talking about now versus yeah. then. Um, oh God. Okay. Again, I'm not a, I'm not a history expert. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that, um, again, we've made a lot of progress. I think there are powers that be that wanted to go back to that where we were. Um, I think we all see that, right? Um, and I think, I think the people, who, I think, I do believe the majority of people in this country want a united world. I, I, I believe that. I, I, you know, maybe I'm, but I do believe that. And I, I think that people, we have to be more vocal and louder than the people who don't. Because I think the people who don't are winning right now. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. Sure. I have a question for you. So <clears throat> I know you say that as a black woman and being the first black columnist uh, for, the co for the Chronicle was not, you know, you felt the pressure of the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me, after you wrote your first column, what was that like for you? Well, again, that, that, that column came on the day my dad died. And the, and, the, and the column was about my dad's relationship with Reverend Lawson, William Lawson in, in Houston, who um, just passed. And he was really pivotal in, in the civil rights movement in Houston and helping to integrate Houston in a very um, peaceful way. Um, and I don't know if you know, but Houston, you know, while, the less, while much of the South was experiencing extreme um, the br brutality of integration and, and, and um, Houston integrated very quietly and entered very, very peacefully. And that was strategic. And that was there. And I, I have learned that in my research of my um, columns. And, and Reverend Lawson was at the center of that. 
And Man, what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what, what was the question? I said, what, 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 I'm sorry. I, 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 was, I was going here. Where was the, what was the question? <laughs> uh, cause I, was, I was like, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, got okay. Uh, so, so, so the column, so the column, the column that appeared on my, when my dad died was about his relationship with Reverend Lawson. And when my dad was in hospice, at home hospice, um, and Reverend Lawson came over, and I, because I, I, t I, I let him know that um, this was ha that dad was in hospice, hospice, and Reverend Lawson came over. He was in a wheelchair, and they sat next to each other. And they know, and, they, and Reverend Lawson is from Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas, too. So they're both from the same, same, um, same place. They were about four or five years apart. And they sat and talked about their lives and talked about civil rights. And that's when I found out Dad said he walked walk with Martin Luther King. I'm like, wait, what? Wait, how did I not know that? You know, and so, and, and it was just this beautiful conversation between two old black men talking about, all the things that they've done together, and and and, and um, you know, evaluating their lives, whether they had done what they you know set out to do, whether they had, it, it, it was pretty amazing. So when that column ran, it just, it, I don't, I think, it, it was, it was, it, I, I don't know how I would describe how I felt, but I just, it was beautiful to me. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That keeps me having a job. I got kids to take care of. Them. Uh, I think it's on our website. So it's joy.sewing at houstonchronicle.com. So joy.sewing at houstonchronicle.com. I, I will say that in this role has, has exposed me in a way that I didn't think I would exposed me in a way that I wasn't prepared for. Um, I'm used to, you know, people reading my work. I'm used to people maybe knowing, some, you know, a little bit about me. But when I started writing about race, when I started writing about women's issues, when I started about writing about some of these hard, tough issues, people, there were some, a lot of mean, mean comments, racially motivated comments, the N-word used, and my life threatened. And, and so, you know, I've ta have to, have ha had to take precautions about how I manage my safety. Um, but I will continue to do this. But I just, I, I, I recognize that it's a di I'm in a different realm right now. And I have to be a lot more mindful about how I, how I, how I approach story. Not how I, it doesn't change how I, would, how I would write about it. But it does make me really consider, like, Okay, I'm going to write about this, and so I know I'm going to get some of these, these people over here who are going to come for me. So I need to make sure that my editor knows and everybody knows that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm buckling down on security right now. So, yeah. Yes. Maybe not. Oh, sorry. Uh, we've got time for one more, so I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Are you asking questions? If, oh, if you don't mind, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for being sure, here. Sure. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of uh, people here by way of New Orleans. I'm one of those people oh, as you? well. Okay. Um, my, my aunt, she she's a nurse by trade. Uh -huh. But what she does in her free time is she's been chronicling our family tree. And she found out that our ancestry comes from Alabama um, as slaves. And she's finding out so much interesting um, information and I really appreciate her for being that you know chronicler of our history because we didn't have it before she started doing this work and it just reminded me of how your your uncle has this memoir and you're going through it and you're telling these stories so I'm really just curious about if you're going to keep chron or chronicling and doing your journalistic work in the lane of your own family and if so, like, I think so, because you know what, if I didn't have this book, if I didn't have, and he details like great grandparents, if I didn't have this, we wouldn't have it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't really know. We might could guess, we could probably piece it together, but he has given us the map 
about family here. And I, and I realize how important it is to tell a story and how important it is to talk to elders and get the story down on paper, not just like verbally, because people forget, you know, people, you know, they don't remember. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's so important. I, you know, it's interesting, a lot, I heard a lot of people during the pandemic started um, doing DNA tests in 23andMe and Ancestry. And I ordered about, I ordered like five of them. I was like, okay, we're gonna do them. And I'm like, and then I got a call from my, um, a good friend in Chicago who's a journalist and she says, girl, are you sitting down? I said, no, okay, I'll sit down, let me sit down. And so she says, you know, remember the man who lived across the street? She says, well, I, f I just found out that I have a sister and her father, who she thought was her father, was not her father, it's a man across the street, who used to wave at her in the window. And I was like, <laughs> and then I had a colleague who told me she did the same thing during the pandemic, found out she has three other siblings she didn't know anything about, okay? Then I had another friend, and I was like, okay, I'm not doing now. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, but I, I was talking to a cousin and she, she, she started researching, because the sewing side, I said, we know my mom's side is pretty, a big family and it's, there's been a lot of extensive research done. But my dad's side, I didn't really know that one. Like sewing is not, is not a common name. Um, and usually if, they're, if you see a sewing, we're related. And um, so she started researching and she found out, well, it looks like there was, you were Sims first and then you became sewing. I said, Okay, my boyfriend in college was a Sims. That does not, I was like, no. I said, like, I'm not, I reject that. So, so, uh, so we are sewings, and that's what we're going, we're going to stick with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. All right. Hi, Joy. Hi. I'm Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you for coming. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, my question to you, do you think you pursue doing like a book or something about Juneteenth? Huh? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think as I used to say, you know, people. It's funny. People think journalists, oh, every journalist wants, wants to write a book. And you, when I was younger, everybody would say, "Are you going to write a book?" I said, "Well, I don't know anything yet." And I was in my twenties, and I said, "I have to. I have to feel like I lived my life." Well, okay, I'm I'm way past my twenties, and I feel like I have lived my life. And I think I probably will have a book at some point, but I don't know. I don't know if Juneteenth is it. I don't know if it's family. I don't. I, I don't know what it is. And I and I keep and I, I do keep thinking about it, um, and I read other other books and um, and get inspired. So you know, hopefully one day, and hopefully one day people will buy it, and you know, it'll be nice. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna end it there. I think I can say that everyone here would definitely read it, Joy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I would be excited okay. to see it. Um, okay. Well, that's all. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.